Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Swati, consultant microbiologist at Ishoda Group of Hospitals. Today, we have come here to, each year we commemorate World TV Day to raise public awareness about the devastating health, social and economic consequences of TB and step up efforts to end the global TB pandemic. The date marks the day in 1982 when Dr. Robert Koch announced that he had discovered the bacterium that causes TB, which opened the way towards the diagnosing and curing this disease. TB remains one of the world's deadliest infectious killers. Each day, over 4,100 people lose their lives to TB and close to 28,000 people fall ill with this preventable and curable disease. And global efforts to combat, combat TB, have, TB have saved many lives. The theme of the World TB Day 2020, Invest when TB Save Lives, conveys the urgent need to invest the resources to ramp up the fight against TB and achieve the commitment to end TB. This is especially critical in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have teamed up here today to discuss or create awareness on the very basic or the initial step to end TB, that is diagnosing the TB. We begin this session with our first speaker, Dr. N. Pavani. I would like to introduce Dr. Pavani. Dr. Pavani is currently working as a consultant current microbiologist at Ishoda Hospital, Sikindrabad. She did her MBBS from Kaja Banda Nawaz Institute of Medical Sciences, Gulbarga, and MD in Microbiology from Chelmada Anandrav Institute of Medical Sciences, Karimnagar. Dr. Pavani's special areas of interest are diagnostic microbiology, are diagnostic microbiology, antimicrobial stewardship, and hospital infection prevention control. She has several presentations and uh, in various national and international forums, in various international and internet to her credit. Today, Dr. Pavani would be talking about the way landscape of tuberculosis in the pandemic era and the NTEP diagnostic algorithm. Over to Dr. Pavani. Well, thank you, Dr. Swati. So I begin this uh, session the, with the, to give an overview of the TB diagnostic algorithms in our national program. So as we all know, even years of discovery of uh, organism causing TB, TB still remains one of the Sorry, um, TB still remains one of the infectious, uh, one of the top infectious killers in the world. In 2020, an estimated of 1.5 billion people died from TB. And the drug resistant TB still remains a public health crisis and a health security threat. So globally, efforts have been made to combat TB, which has saved an estimated of 66 million lives since the year 2000. However, globally, the year 2020 also witnessed a sweeping COVID-19 pandemic devastate, devastating lives, economies, health systems, and public health programs across the world with a record-breaking speed. In just a few months, the pandemic has reversed years of progress made in the fight against TB. And for the first time in an over decade, TB deaths increased in 2020. The advent of this pandemic has further caused impediments in timely diagnosis of TB, similar to other infectious diseases in the country, and has put enormous challenges and unprecedented stress on the healthcare system and related activities through the world, throughout the world. And RNTCP, and now called the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program, was no exception. So then. Um, the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program is the main organization, main government organization in India dealing with the TB elimination. And this program gives priority in detecting and treating all types of TB cases. So the four strategic pillars of the National Strategic Plan for TB Elimination 2017-2025 are detect, treat, prevent, and build. 
So the pandemic has disrupted all these four primary concept uh, components of the NSPs. So leading to a 25% decrease in the notification of TB in the year 2020, 2020 when compared to the other years before the pandemic. The prevalence of TB among COVID-19 patients has been found to be about, around 0.37 to 4.47% in various studies conducted. So uh, TB and COVID-19, or rather any other pandemic that has similar symptoms, uh, uh, called, uh, similar symptoms respiratory uh, as like TB, as uh, TB is a great mimicker. So uh, social distancing strategies during COVID-19 have not only helped us to grab these uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections, but also helped to limit the TB spread, the aerosols of which remain suspended in the air for about 10 days. So uh, as TB mimics both the, any other diseases, any other respiratory infections, along with the COVID, there have been few activities carried out. So one of the, uh, so the common, so the dual morbidity of TB and the, the COVID-19, the following activities were carried out, like the bidirectional TB screening, the TB screening for all the ILI cases, that is influenza-like illness cases, and TB screening for the SARS, uh, SARI cases. So to begin with, um, the bidirect, though COVID-19 has come down now, but a brief overview of how the screening has to be as a bidirectional screen, uh, screening of TB and COVID should be done is COVID screen, the eligibility criteria would be like COVID screening for all the diagnosed TB patient and TB screening for all COVID positive patients. So in this, those are newly diagnosed TB or those who are currently on the TB. TB treatment. So they should be, uh, they should, based on the COVID-19 test, further management would be undertaken as per the MOHFW guidelines. Then TB screening for all the COVID positive patients would be the eligibility criteria is the 4S symptom complex, that is the cough of more than two weeks, persistent fever for more than two weeks, significant weight loss in the night sweats, and then history of contact with the TB cases and history of TB. So for these patients also, the guidelines goes the same. Diagnosed if, the, if they have to a COVID-19 patient screening test to be done, an upfront chest X-ray and an upfront NAT is offered for them. So diagnosed with TB, then manage the TB, manage according to the guidelines. If it is not diagnosed as TB, then follow up as a COVID-19 patient. Then screening for ILI, TB screening for ILI cases. So the eligibility criteria would be any ILI case with four symptom complex, history of contact with TB case and ILI symptoms persisting for more than 10 days. Even in these cases, screening of TB would be like an upfront NAT test. Then if they are diagnosed with TB, then go for the NDEP guidelines of treatment. And if they are not uh, diagnosed as TB, then go with the ILI case management as per the guidelines. Then TB screening for the SARI cases, the eligibility criteria would be any SARI case with four symptom complex, then history of uh, contact with TB case and SARI symptoms persisting, persisting for more than 10 days. And this also, the screening of TB would be a chest X-ray and an upfront NAT. If they are diagnosed with TB, go with the guidelines of NT and TEP, or if they are not diagnosed as TB, then follow up the MOHFW guidelines for the SARI cases. So as I've already said, uh, the uh, NTEP is the uh, Indian organization which, is, which deals with the elimination of the TB. So this program also uh, gives priority in detecting and treating of all types of TB. That is, including extra pulmonary, pulmonary, pediatric TB, and the drug-resistant TB. So although early diagnosis and treatment of active TB remains a top priority in India, preventing TB by finding and treating uh, TB infections and active cases findings amongst high-risk groups are extremely important steps towards ending TB. So I would deal with the, the first, uh, this is an integrated management algorithm for TB and the TB infection. So to begin with, the presumptive TB. So what is a presumptive TB? Who is called as a, who is uh, known to be a presumptive TB? There's one or more of the following is positive. In adults, if there is a cough of uh, more than two weeks, for a fever of more than two weeks, significant weight loss, night sweats, and the hemoptosis. And, uh, and in children, if there is a persistent fever or cough of more than two weeks, loss of weight and no weight gain, and history of contact with the infectious TB cases. 
And for the extra pulmonary case, an extra pulmonary present of or presence of organ specific symptoms and signs and signs like swelling of the lymph nodes, pleural effusions, pain and swelling in the joints, neck stiffness, disorientations, along with the constitutional symptoms like significant weight loss, persistent fever, and the night sweats. So the diagnostic algorithm begins this way. <laughs> So all the key population, that is the patients living with HIV, then the children, then extra pulmonary TB cases will be preferentially offered an upfront CBNAT test. So the common tests which are done in this algorithm would be the CBNAT, microscopy, and the chest X-ray. And the other tests would include the ultrasounds, radiology, then the histopathology, histopathology examinations. So for the presumptive pulmonary TB patients should be subjected for smear microscopy. Ideally, two sputum smear specimens are collected, spot and early morning, or two sp uh, supervised sputum specimens collected at least one hour apart. If one or both of the smears is positive, then the patient is diagnosed as microbiologically confirmed pulmonary tuberculosis. If the smear is negative, then they are subjected to CBNAT. If CBNAT, in CBNAT, if MTB is not detected and chest X-ray is suggestive of TB or otherwise, but the clinicians consider TB as probable diagnosis after ruling out other alternative diagnosis, then the patient is labeled as clinically diagnosed TB. So if this uh, if the specimen subjected to CBNAT in this MTB is detected and the fampicin is sensitive, then the program offers the first line line probe assay to look for the isoniazid monoresistance or the polyresistance. So in the, in the first line line probe assay suggests um, isony as it's sensitive, then it is considered as drug resistant TB and treated accordingly. And if the first line line probe assay suggests isony as resistant, then the patient is managed as per the diagnosed uh, drug resistant TB algorithm. So in the drug resistant TB algorithm, if uh, rifampicin is detected, then it is considered as MDR TB. And if, um, if rifampicin, it is considered as rifampicin resistant TB. And MDR TB is like a, a isoniazide and rifampicin resistance. And all the rest, all the first line drugs are sensitive. It is considered as MDR TB. So if uh, MTB is detected and rifampicin resistant is detected, so the program offers, the algorithm offers first line as well as second line line probe assay along with the liquid culture DST, liquid cultures with DST. In the second line line probe assay, if the fluoroquinolones are sensitive, then the patient is considered as MDR TB or the rifampicin resistant TB. And if the fluoroquinolones are resistant, then they are considered as the XDR TB. So coming on to the other, uh, the next part of the algorithm would be the uh, tuberculosis infection in the high risk group. So what is TBI? That is tuberculosis infection is a state of um, persistent immune response to stimulation by mycobacterium tuberculosis antigens with no evidence of clinically manifestation of the TB. So there is no gold standard test for direct detection of uh, MTB infection in humans. But most infected people have no signs or symptoms of TB, but are, risk of uh, are at risk of developing TB diseases. The common groups would be the patients living with HIV, then all con contacts of uh, bacteriologically confirmed the pulmonary TB index patients. Then the other risk groups would be the immunocompromised patients or the transplant patients, dialysis patients, or the pa patients who are on and uh, who are on biologic. So the, the algorithm grows uh, in such a way that for the TBI risk groups so would be the forest screening. What is forest is, as I've, as I've mentioned earlier, forest screened is the four symptoms, that is the cough, fever, weight loss, and the night sweats. If, uh, uh, if, it is, if they are present, then there is an active infection, then you have to rule out the active infection and you have to go for the TSD or the IGRAS. If they are positive, then go for the chest X-ray. Chest X-ray doesn't uh, uh, suggest anything. It is considered as no, not active TB. And the chest X-ray shows any signs and symptoms, and it is considered as active TB. And they have to, you have to go for the uh, preventive treatment, tuberculosis preventive treatment in such cases. So to combine together the integrated management algorithm for the TB diseases is like this. So this algorithm does not mandatorily decide the order to do the tests or the investigations. If multiple tests are available at the site, they may be offered to the patient to avoid any delay with the focus on the microbiological confirmation. And if the clinician considers 
coexisting clinical conditions along with TB, appropriate investigation should be done to diagnose these conditions. So in brief, that would be an overall uh, view of uh, the diagnostic algorithm of NPT in diagnosis of the TB. So in conclusion, I would like to tell that the lessons learned in the battle against COVID-19 must mostly, most definitely help in providing the insights as to how a country can better the pre-existing programs and strategies to achieve this goal of eliminating TB by, in India by 2025, which is ahead of WHO of 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavani, for the uh, for giving us the insight into the diagnostic algorithm of TB. The next speaker is, uh, is uh, I would like to call the next speaker, Dr. Harita. Dr. Harita is our consultant microbiologist and infection control officer. Consultant microbiologist and infection control officer at uh, Maishada Hospital, Malakpet. She completed her MD microbiology from KMC Manipal and fellowship in hospital infection control from Jipmer Pondicherry. Dr. Harita has over 12 publications in various indexed international and national journals to her credit and has presented in several national and international forums. She has been recipient of several prestigious awards in her career so far. Today, Dr. Harita would be giving us an insight into the diagnostic modalities for tuberculosis. Over to Dr. Harita. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so today, my topic for uh, discussion would be the diagnostic uh, modalities for uh, TB. Uh, so coming to the diagnostic uh, modalities for TB, Dr. Pavani, madam, has uh, clearly explained us the definitions for uh, the uh, different types of the tuberculosis and also the diagnostic algorithms very clearly. Now, next, coming to the diagnostic modalities. Now, there are different diagnostic methods for the diagnosis of TB. We have different diagnostic methods. Now, we are going to discuss about the importance of the each diagnostic method. There is no one particular test for the diagnosis of TB. So there are different methods. And now, we are going to discuss about the importance of each particular test. Uh, so this is the World uh, TB Day theme for 2022, Invest to End TB and Save Lives. Uh, so coming to the diagnosis, we have many different uh, diagnostic methods like smear microscopy, culture, molecular methods, or the PCR methods and x-rays. So which one to choose among these? Uh, so how should a TB diagnostic test be? So it should provide early and accurate diagnosis. It has to be simple reliable and cost effective. It should be capable of discriminating between an infection and a disease. The live and dead bacilli, that is the viability of the bacilli, it should be able to differentiate between the MTB complex and also the non-tuberculous mycobacteria and also the drug sensitivity and the drug resistant tubercle bacilli have to be differentiated. So a TB diagnostic should, uh, test should consist of all these things. Uh, next, coming to the diagnostic tools, it can be summarized as the clinical, radiological, and microbiological tools. So now, basically, I will be concentrating on the microbiological diagnosis of the TB. Uh, so this is how I would like to classify the microbiological diagnosis of TB. It would go like, first would be the sputum smear microscopy. So we can do the smear microscopy either by the ZN staining or the fluorescent staining. Then comes the culture. The culture would be solid culture or the liquid culture. Solid culture would be the LJ media and the liquid culture, we have various uh, automated liquid culture media like the uh, Bactec Midget, the Bacti Alert and the Versatrec. And the rapid molecular test would be the NAT, that is the gene expert and the line probe assay. And the other investigations would be the MODS, that is microscopic observation of the drug susceptibility, the TBPCR, the LAMP and the LAMP. And the diagnosis of latent, to, uh, latent TB can be done by the tuberculin skin test, that is the TST and the interferon gamma release assay. So now we are going to discuss about the each different modality. Uh, first, come to the process for the sputum specimen collection. So two samples should be collected within a day or two consecutive days. So the first sample should be collected at spot under supervision. And the next sample would be collected on the next day early morning. So at least 2 ml of sputum has to be collected. It should be mucopurulent in consistency. 
uh, coming to the uh, process for the other specimen collection that if you are suspecting an extra pulmonary TB, then appropriate specimens from the presumed sites has to be collected. Uh, next, coming to the microscopy, it is the century old technique. Minimal infrastructure is required and also suitable for the peripheral labs. It is a simple, rapid, and cheap test, suitable for any sample type, but the sensitivity is around 40 to 50 percent that you can detect only 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli per ml. And the microscopic method also, there are two different microscopic methods. The first one is the light microscopy, and the second one would be the fluorescent microscopy technique. So recently, there's a development of the LED microscope that is the fluorescent microscopy technique and which has the low power consumption and has led to the development of the simple, robust LED fluorescent microscopy. Uh, so this is how the bacilli look on the normal ZN stain. That is, the background will be stained as the blue color and the uh, pink color bacilli can be seen, the beaded bacilli. So this is how the bacilli look like on the ZN staining. And this is the uh, grading of the sputum smear on the ZN staining, how we give. So all of us already know this. So the grading is done as uh, 0, scanty, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. Based on this, we grade it as negative or positive. Uh, coming to the fluorescent uh, staining. So this is how the bacilli look on the fluorescent staining. The bacilli fluorescence uh, have the fluorescence. And uh, this is the grading of the sputum, sputum smear on the fluorescent staining. It is the same. That is, we give the grading as 0, scanty, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. Uh, next, coming to the advantages and the limitations of microscopy. So the advantages would be it can be done at the point of care sites by the trained microscopist and detects the patients most likely to transmit the disease and pose an infection risk. Accessible to majority of the patients and monitoring of the treatment success can be done. But the limitations, as we've already discussed, the sensitivity is very low and lower even in the HIV cases. The limit of detection would be around 5,000 to 10,000 bacilli per ml. And it is even less in the posse bacillary specimens. And it cannot distinguish between the uh, MTB complex and also the non-tuberculous bacteria. And it cannot even uh, differentiate between the dead and live bacilli and the drug sensitive and the drug resistant bacilli. And the requirement of skill to avoid the false positives and false negatives, because many times some artifacts may be given as the false positives. So trained microscopists are very important for this. And artifacts may confound with interpretation in the fluorescence microscope. So these are the different advantages and limitations of the microscopy. Next, coming to the automated microscopy method. This is the automated microscopy method, which is there. So it utilizes the novel software algorithms to scan the high resolution digital images of fluorescent smears to automatically score the fluorescence bodies. So a system will be attached to the microscope and it will do the automatic reading and scoring of the smears. Uh, next, coming to the culture media, we have the culture media as a solid media. Example is the most common example would be the LJ media. Next, the conventional liquid culture, that is the Kitchener's media and the Middlebrook 7H9 media. And coming to the automated liquid culture, that is the midget, the backpick, and the Versatrek. So this is the classification for the culture media. First, coming to the solid culture, LJ media is routinely used in laboratories for the culture and the drug susceptibility testing. It provides the definitive diagnosis. And as all of us know, culture is the gold standard for the diagnosis. And it is suitable for all specimen types, but requires decontamination to eliminate the common contaminants. Inoculated media are incubated for a prolonged period of six to eight weeks. It takes around six to eight weeks for the culture to grow. Next, coming to the automated liquid culture, it monitors the growth continuously. That is, every 60 minutes, it keeps on monitoring the growth. And it provides a faster turnaround time when compared to the uh, conventional culture. That is, positive growth is detected in only three to four weeks. So this liquid culture media, what does it contain? It mainly contains the Middlebrook 7H9 medium, which is supplemented with OADC. That is, it contains, that is the nutritional supplement which it contains. And also Fanta, these are the uh, mixture of the antibiotics. So antibiotic mixture is also present. So the examples for the automated liquid culture would be the Bactec midget, the Bactialer, and the Versatrek, which we would be discussing now. Uh, coming to the Bactec midget, it is the mycobacterial growth indicator tube. We call it as the 960 because 960 tubes can be accommodated in this system. So it is highly sensitive, can detect even 10 bacilli per ml, and it monitors, and it is the automated hourly growth monitoring takes place. 
and coming to the uses it detects growth of the mycobacteria and also performs the drug susceptibility testing for the first and second line drug so this midget system is not only used for the diagnosis of the tb but it can also be used for the drug susceptibility testing for both the first and the second line drugs so the principle is it uses an oxygen sensitive fluorescent compound which is dissolved in the broth so initially what happens is there is large amount of oxygen which is dissolved in the medium which quenches the emission from the fluorescent compound later what happens when the organism start growing it starts it starts utilizing the oxygen which quenches the effect and allows the fluorescence to be detected so this is how the or the uh, tubes fluoresce and the uh, the machine detects the fluorescence and a beep sound will be heard but uh, by seeing which we can know that the organism is detected and has flagged positive Uh, next coming to the bacteria alert 3d so this also contains the media that is the modified middle brook 7h9 medium it also contains some mixture of the oadc and panta and uh, a decontamination step is required so it has the carbon dioxide sensor at the bottom and carbon dioxide sensor is impacted by the light and reflected lays are monitored by the photodiode so this is how the bacteria alert machine looks like and this is how the bottles look like so when we see the bottom of the bottles the negative bottles will have the, will be green in color and whenever the fluorescence will be detected and they de they'll be detected as positive the color will be changed at the bottom the color will be changed into yellow uh, next come to the versa trick it also contains the modified middlebrook 7h9 medium oadc enriched and it has two types of antimicrobial mixture that is one is used when there is less risk of contamination and the other can be used when there is high risk of contamination So the principle which it which it acts on is it is based on the pressure changes within the head space above the broth culture medium that is either the gas production or the gas consumption by the microbes. Uh, next, coming to the culture identification. Now, when the organism is identified in the culture, either by any of the above three methods which I have already mentioned, the next procedure would be when the colonies either grow on the LJ media or any positively flagged bottle, they are subjected to the acid fast staining. So if the acid fast staining turns out to be positive, then the further tests are done for the identification, like the MPT sixty four antigen. So this mainly detects the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. So when the culture flag is positive, we do the MPT sixty four antigen test. So if the MPT sixty four antigen test turns out to be positive, we give the report as Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex is detected and it is positive. when we do not see this so the non tuberculous mycobacteria may be suspected and the further uh, identification species identification can be done by the further pcr technique so this is how the culture identification is done next coming to advantages and limitations of the culture so the advantages are it is more sensitive than microscopy and detection limit is 10 to 100 viable bacilli so it mainly indicates the viability drug susceptibility can be performed and it can also differentiate between the mtb complex and the mycobacteria other than tuberculosis that is the non tuberculous mycobacteria so the limitations here would be the slow growth of the tb bacilli that is for the solid culture it takes around 6 to 8 weeks for the growth and for liquid culture it takes around 3 to 4 weeks so mainly dependence on skill is very important and infrastructure not suitable for the resource poor settings then requires the bsl2 facilities and cross contamination leading to the wrong diagnosis may take place uh next coming to the uh, the molecular diagnosis so why is the molecular diagnosis important for tb for because it has increased sensitivity to detect even the smear negative cases and it can even detect the drug resistance and quick results that is rapid turnaround time when compared to even the liquid cultures and the diagnosis of the patients at an earlier stage for treatment initiation and to cut down the transmission molecular diagnosis is very important coming to the advantages and limitations of the molecular diagnosis advantages is shorter turnaround time good performance characteristics and it can be performed directly on the clinical specimens no need to do the culture and wait for the culture to grow and less biohazard risk when coming to the limitations here the limitations would be the infrastructure experienced staff are required and the automations in the molecular diagnosis also are also are lot of expensive so this is one of the limitation and finding a mutation per se does not indicate that it is the drug resistant strain and cannot be used for the follow up studies so these are the advantages and the limitations of the molecular diagnosis so coming to the examples of the different molecular tests for the tb diagnosis and also the drug susceptibility testing so these tests not only diagnose the 
TB, but can also perform the drug susceptibility testing. So the examples for these would be the CBNAT, that is the gene expert, LPA, line probe assay, and the TRUNAT. And following this, the sequencing technologies we have, that is the pyro sequencing and the whole genome sequencing. Come to the CBNAT, that is the gene expert. So as all of us know, it is based on the semi-nested real-time PCR technique. And it can detect the mycobacterium tuberculosis and also the rifampicin resistance. So it is FDA approved and it is rolled out in India by the Central TB Division in 2014. So the gene expert have a reduced turnaround time. That is the results will be available almost in less than two hours or 80 minutes. So it detects the MTB as well as the rifampicin resistance conferring mutations directly from all these specimens. And the analytical sensitivity here would be 131 bacilli per ml. So this is the detailed procedure which shows how the gene expert works and how the sample has to be loaded. Uh, next, come to the advantages and disadvantages of the gene expert. So advantages is rapid turnaround time. That is in less than two hours, the results would be out. Ability to detect very low number of organisms, the sensitivity is 131 bacilli per ml. And detection of MTB and the drug susceptibility, that is the rifampicin resistance also it can detect. And the identification is done directly from the samples. It is, uh, it is a complete automated process. We just need to load the sample in the uh, machine and the whole PCR process takes place inside the machine only. And eliminating the human errors and cross-contamination from other samples. But the disadvantages would be the false results due to the presence of amplification inhibitors in the samples the cost and requirement of the technical staff, then amplification from the dead bacilli and treatment monitoring would not be possible. And stringent methods for the quality control and quality assurance are required and cannot be used independently for the diagnosis. And the machine and the cartridge are temperature sensitive. So this has to be taken care of because many times we may get some uh, indeterminate results or invalid results. So the machine and cartridge temperature maintenance is very important and blood or blood tint stamp samples cannot be used and it has a very low sensitivity for the plural fluid samples. Uh, next coming to the TRUNAT. So TRUNAT is mainly by the Molbio Diagnostics and set to detect the TB in the sputum within one hour by processing the sputum on a semi-automated battery operated portable device. So this is how the device looks like. It is battery operated and the advantages are the automated battery operated device. It can be used at the level of PHC where the gene expert cannot be used because it needs a continuous power supply. But the limitations is very expensive and cannot further speciate the MTB complex and it can only test one sample at a time. Next, coming to the line probe assay. So the line probe assay are the molecular tests based on the liver reverse hybridization DNA strip technology. So probes to identify the MTB complex are present, which detect the mutations in the RPOB gene, that is for the rifampicin resistance, and mutations in the isoniazid and the CAD-G gene promoter for the isoniazid resistance. So WHO recommends the use of line probe assay as a rapid diagnostic test for the detection of the rifampicin and isoniazid resistance. So the right has a rapid turnaround time of around 72 hours. So this is how the machine looks like and this is how the strip looks like. And these are the different mutations which it identifies. Uh, so there are two molecular assays are currently available. That is, we call them as the HAIN assays. That is the genotype MDR drug resistant plus and the genotype MDR, the second line drug resistance. So there are two LPS present. That is, it can detect the resistance to the first line drugs and also the second line drugs. And the second one is the Inolipa RIF-TB by Belgium. But coming to the limitations of the line probe assay, it requires suitable facilities and adequate skilled laboratory personnel, and it can be performed only on the positive culture specimens or the smear positive clinical specimens. It cannot be performed on the smear negative uh, uh, samples because the sensitivity is very low. It, um, sensitivity is very low in smear negative cases or fossi bacillary TB and extra pulmonary TB samples. So these are the limitations of the line probe assay. Next, coming to the Gene Expert Ultra. So this is the same as the Gene Expert only, but it has a higher sensitivity, especially in the smear negative TB cases, and the results will be ready in less than 80 minutes. And increased accuracy of the rifampicin results, and here the sensitivity would be 16 bacilli per ml. So next, coming to sequence-based testing. So sequence-based testing is provide the genetic identity of a particular mutation, and therefore can predict the drug resistance with greater accuracy. So the examples here would be the pyro sequencing, Sanger sequencing, or the next generation sequencing. 
coming to the other investigations other than the microscopy or the molecular tests and the culture methods the other investigations which can be used is the tb pcr so it detects nearly all the smear positive and the culture positive cases and useful technology for rapid diagnosis in the smear negative active tb patients also so it mainly targets the insertion sequence 6110 which is found especially in the mtb complex and not in the non tuberculous mycobacteria so it is specific for the mtb complex Coming to a lipoarabinoma and assay. So, what is this? We call it as the LAM assay. So, what is this? So, LAM antigen detection in the urine mainly it is done. So, it is a LAM is a carbohydrate a cell wall antigen that is excreted in the urine of the TB patients. So, the sensitivity is high in patients with HIV. So, this is how the strip looks like, and this is where the sample has to be put, and this is the control band. So, this is the immunochromatographic test which is used, and this is how we can predict the result. So coming to the MODS, this is the microscopic observation of the drug susceptibility. So a microcolony method based on the direct inoculation of the patient specimen to a drug-free and the drug-containing liquid media, followed by the microscopic evaluation of the early culture growth. So the culture growth can be seen as the pod formation. So the growth of MTB is identified the typical pod formation under the inverted light microscope. So the, we have the two tubes. When growth is seen in the drug-free media, then it means that it is the positive culture. When growth is seen in both the media, it means it indicates the resistance. And average positive results take around nine days. Coming to the lamp, that is the loop-mediated isothermal amplification for TB. So this method employs DNA polymerase and four primers. Which recognizes six different sequence on the target DNA. So the whole process is carried out at isothermal reaction that is at the same temperature of sixty three degrees. Next, coming to the WHO recommendations, what does the WHO recommend for this? So WHO recommended three new classes of technologies. So the class of technologies would be the first one that is the moderate complexity automated NADs for the detection of TB and resistance to rifampicin and isoniazid. The second one would be the low complexity automated NADs for the detection of resistance to isoniazid and the second line anti TB agents. And the third one would be the high complexity reverse hybridization based NADs for the detection of the pyrazinamide resistance. The examples for these I would be showing in the next slide. So moderate complexity automated NADs for the detection of TB and resistance to rifampicin would be the about MTB detection and also the rifampicin resistance automated machine. Then the BD Max MDR TB by BD Company, and the Cobas MTB and the Cobas MTB rifampicin and isoniazid and the fluorotype MTB drug resistance type. So these are the examples for the moderate complexity automated NADs. Next, coming to the low complexity automated NADs, the example is the Gene Expert MTB XDR. And the line probe assays, we've already discussed about that. Then the last would be the MTB Ultra. We have already discussed about that, the Gene Expert Ultra and the True NAT. Now we are going to discuss about the Gene Expert MTB XDR. So what is this? It is mainly for the diagnosis of the pre-XDR TB from the unprocessed sputum specimens or the concentrated sediments from the sputum. So it offers it is offered to all the MTB positive cases as a reflex test to aid in the diagnosis before the start of the therapy. So it can detect genes responsible for isoniazid, ethionamide, fluoroquinolones, and also the second line injectable drugs. And the turnaround time is very less, that is around the 90 minutes. Coming to the BD Max MDR TB assay. So this is also has a direct detection of the MTB complex from the raw sputum samples, and it can detect the mutations in the RPOB gene and also the TAG gene. So they provide the results for 24 specimens in about less than four hours. Next, come to the about real-time MTB and about real-time MTB rifampicin and isoniazid. So this automated machine can detect both the MTB complex and also the resistance to the rifampicin and isoniazid. The so same with the COBAS, it can detect the MTB complex and also the resistance to isoniazid and rifampicin. Uh, so the NADs in development are uh, the uh, single Cepheid, the gene expert machine with a single uh, cartridge which can be used and also the allier instrument for the TB testing which is currently in development. So these are the different diagnostic modalities for the diagnosis of the TB. Now for the diagnosis of the latent TB, we have two investigations. That is the tuberculin skin test and also the interferon gamma release assays. But there is no gold standard test for the diagnosis of the latent TB. So tuberculin skin test, all of us know how to uh, do it. 
Next, coming to the interferon gamma release assays, it uses the highly specific MTB antigens such as the CFP10 ESAT6. And also the commercial kits which are available are the Quantiferon TB Gold Assay and the T-Spot TB. So these both are used for the latent TB. That is for the diagnosis of the uh, close contacts of the active TB patients or the recently diagnosed TB cases. Okay, So these both investigations are for the latent TB patients. So the diagnostic algorithm, uh, Dr. Pavani Madam has already explained in detail about this. And the next coming to the methods for the drug susceptibility testing, we've already discussed about this. So there are rapid molecular drug resistant testing, genotypic testing is available. That is by the NAT, that is the nucleic acid amplification test, that is the gene expert can detect it. And even the line probe assay can detect the drug susceptibility testing for both the first and second line drugs. And coming to the midget, that is the liquid culture, it can also detect the drug, resist, uh, drug susceptibility testing for both the first and second line drugs. So coming to the summary, these are the different diagnostic modalities for TB. We've discussed about the microscopy, solid culture, automated liquid culture, gene expert, line probe assay, true NAT, TB PCR, LAM, LAM, MODS, and for the latent TB, the diagnostic modalities would be the TST and the IGRA. So I wanted to I want to just conclude my presentation by telling that these are the different diagnostic modalities, and each different diagnostic modality has its own importance. So these were the references and in conclusion, much progress is being made. That is initially we used to use the solid culture. Now come the liquid culture and also the nucleic acid amplification test. And also for the microscopy, we used to use the normal light microscope. Now we have the fluorescence microscopy. So this is how the era goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harita for covering the diagnosis of TB right from microscopy to molecular. Our next speaker is Dr. Vinu Kalkuti. He is the medical affairs manager from BD India. He is going to tell us about the low role of liquid cultures and moderate complexity in that. Um, thank you, Dr. Pavani. Hope my screen is visible. Uh, the Dr. screen is visible. visible. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll give a short presentation on overall. Most of the things have been spoken by Dr. Harita until now uh, regarding the various uh, diagnostic modalities that is available for the diagnosis as well as management for tuberculosis. So I'll just briefly run you through what is the overall role of liquid cultures in the TB program, that is NTEP program, and uh, uh, talk about uh, the new moderate complexity NAT, which has been approved uh, by the WHO in 2021, especially the BD Max platform, and how it plays a role in management of tuberculosis. So we also uh, the backtech midget uh, instrument, so it comes into uh, modes that is 960 as well as 320 uh, positions. It's a highly sensitive equipment, uh, which is for automated system for hourly growth monitoring of microbacteria species. And it is useful for all the samples except blood and urine. And it has a very high sensitivity. So the load of uh, limit of detection is 10 bacilli per ml. And it has a negative protocol for about 42 days. Coming to the uh, drug susceptibility testing, which is done using this uh, uh, midget platform. So as per the um, <clears throat> uh, PMDT guidelines, phenotypic drug susceptibility testing includes performing DHT using midget, uh, which is the preferred method for DHT to many anti-TB drugs. So the following drugs can be tested using the um, um, midget platform, that is in group A drugs, we have levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, baraquilin, linazolid, and in group B, we have clofazamine, and in group C, we have belamanid, pyrazinamide, amitacin, and streptomycin. And uh, this PMDT guidelines also talks about that if, if resistance is detected, Using uh, LPA, then liquid culture DHT has to be set up for uh, doing DHT for pyrazinamide, moxifloxacin, linozolid, clofazamine, badaclin, and dilamanide. Uh, then, um, as per the program uh, in the culture and the, uh, drug susceptibility centers, uh, where, wherever the second sample is sent, uh, in uh, where uh, we do mostly the uh, line probe assays. Uh, if, uh, if the case is a smear positive case, then it, uh, it can be directly uh, uh, I mean, subjected to line probe assay. Whereas if it is a smear negative case, as Harita has also rightly pointed out, we cannot do uh, uh, LPA directly. So if it is a smear negative case, then in such cases, it has to be subjected for liquid culture that is using midget. And once it turns out to be positive, these positive isolates have been subjected to line probe assay. So which increases the turnaround time and that line probe essay is called as indirect line probe essay. 
Coming to the other roles of liquid culture, which is very important, is the monitoring of treatment response. So uh, all the guidelines, especially the WHO as well as PMDT guidelines, talks about it. So the WHO consolidated guidelines for drug resistant tuberculosis uh, also says that uh, the culture is the standard method for monitoring the patient response, especially uh, following the MDRTB treatment. And the same is true for PMDT guidelines also, where culture uh, has a definite role in uh, follow-up of the patient. So. Um, uh, Follow-up cultures uh, results will be the basis for declaring the final treatment outcome for all MDR and rifampicin resistance TB patients. So finally, uh, where does the midget plays a role? That is the liquid culture plays a role is primarily for the follow-up uh, of the patients uh, to monitor the treatment response for detection of drug resistant in patients of drug resistant TB. And also it can be beneficial, especially in diagnosis of quasi-bacillary cases like uh, extra pulmonary TB, HIV and pediatric uh, TB patients where the bacillary load is very low. And since the sensitivity of uh, liquid cultures is high, uh, it can be used for diagnosis also. And it is also definitely beneficial in long-term follow-up of the patient following the completion of the treatment for early detection of recurrence. And along with that, in some special circumstances where uh, rifampicin resistance is indeterminate uh, on even on repeat testing using that, then it has to be subjected for liquid culture. So this is what I'm talking about. The second, uh, uh, um, I mean, test second sample which is being tested again with the NAT when we get rifampicin resistance status as indeterminate, then to confirm it, it has to be subjected for liquid cultures. And also, uh, if the con uh, confirmation may be required using liquid cultures, if the LPA result shows inferred resistance. So in such cases, uh, absolutely, the liquid cultures definitely play a significant role. Uh, so finally, uh, <clears throat> uh, as we all know, TB is a very complex disease and management of TB will be um, requiring multiple complementary technologies. So we will be using, uh, it's not just one test, it's a combination of all the tests which Dr. Harita also spoke about, uh, liquid culture, the major DST, the new molecular screening test, and also the sputum smear uh, testing. Uh, so use of all the appropriate technologies gives us the best opportunity for accurate diagnosis and appropriate uh, management of the patients of tuberculosis. So that is about the first part of my presentation. So this also Dr. Harita talked about the recent uh, uh, WHO recommendations 2021, which talks about the moderate complexity automated NARS for detection of TB along with rifampicin and isoniazid resistance, low complexity automated NARS for detection of resistance to isoniazid as well as second line anti TB drugs, and high complexity reverse hybridization based NARS for detection of pyrazinamide resistance. So when coming to the moderate complexity NAT, um, uh, the four systems which has been uh, approved uh, by WHO, one is the about real-time MTB and about um, real-time MTB roof INS. Uh, the BDMAX platform with the MTR TBSA, um, uh, MDR TBSA, and then the COBAS MTP and COBAS MTB RIF INH um, uh, from the Roche and the Fluorotype MDR. MTBDR and the fluorotype MTB from the uh, life sciences. So these are the four moderate complexity NAC which has been approved uh, by the WHO. So I'll be briefly taking you through the uh, MDR TB uh, essay in the BD Max platform. So coming to the BDMAX platform, BDMAX platform is an open-ended molecular system which allows complete automation and uh, standardization of user-defined uh, protocol for sample, uh, right from the sample analysis through the PCR result detections. Uh, automated uh, sample extraction, nucleic acid, um, uh, nucleic acid purification, the PCR and real-time detection are all the components of BDMAX system and it empowers the laboratory with simplified molecular testing by tr truly delivering a walkaway automation, unique versatility for a broad range of molecular tests and different sample types. And it's an open system capability um, with the capability to automate and standardize unique uh, user-defined protocols also. Uh, coming to the BDMAX MDR TBSA. Uh, it is useful for direct detection and determination detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex DNA in raw sputum as well as or in concentrated sputum space, uh, sediments prepared from induced or expectorated sputum. In specimens where um, uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis complex DNA is detected, BDMAX, MDRTB also detects mutation in RPOB gene associated with rifampicin resistance as well as mutation in CADG gene and IMHA promoter region, both of which are associated with isoniazid resistance. And this is a high, uh, uh, high throughput, uh, throughput instrument, provide us results uh, for about 24 specimens in less than uh, four hours. And it is a very highly sensitive instrument with a limit of detection for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex 
complex as low as 0.25 polyforming units per ml. And for the sampsin and isomers at resistance as low as 6 polyforming units per ml. So uh, with the help of MDR TBSA, uh, we can detect four results. That is, it uses PCR MET technology for resistance uh, detection. Uh, it also detects resistance for example uh, with RPOB gene and uh, isoniazid resistance and it has a capability to report separate resistance, I mean uh, separate mutations for, uh, that has been detected for CAT, T and INHA uh, promoter region. It is a fully automated workflow. <clears throat> when coming to the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, it is able to identify multi-copy genomic target IS6001 and IS1081 as well as single copy genomic target. In coming to rifampicin resistance, uh, uh, RRDR codons 507 to 533 and uh, ANHA promoter regent as well as CAT G315 codon can be detected <coughs> using this assay. So this is what I was talking about. So when coming to uh, reporting uh, INH resistance, uh, so it can report separately for whether the mutation for INHA is there or whether the mutation for CAT G is there. So as you know, uh, we are well aware that whenever uh, the, uh, um, I mean, the individual is affected with the uh, um, uh, organism which uh, shows mutation only in INHA gene, um, the, uh, promoter region, uh, whereas if the mutation is not detected uh, at CAT-G gene, uh, or if uh, the CAT-G gene is not detected, then in such cases, definitely uh, uh, we can treat such patients with higher concentration of isoniazid in the uh, uh, treatment regimen. So, so now clinicians can now determine with these separate results which we get out of India TBSA, whether we have to go ahead with either low concentration or high concentration of isoniazid, uh, depending upon the results which we get out of the system. Coming to <clears throat> the advantage of the system, so advantage is, I already told you, uh, it is very highly sensitive when compared to the other moderate complexity net. Uh, so the limit of detection is very low. So here you can see when compared to the other uh, system uh, with, from the published literature that it has a very low for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. The uh, um, limit of detection is as low as 0.5 uh, polyforming units per ml, whereas for if and isoniazid resistance, it is six polyforming units per ml when compared to the other moderate complexity net system. Uh, coming to the comparison of the system uh, with the gold standard that is liquid culture as well as the existing uh, the NAT that is gene expert system. Overall, uh, the sensitivity and specificity for raw sputum is around 94.5% 90, 90, sensitive and specificity is 94.9%. Whereas coming to the process sputum, uh, <clears throat> the sensitivity is around 95.8% and uh, so specificity is 97%. Whereas uh, um, Specificity and sensitivity for detection of rifampicin and isoniazid resistance in case of raw sputum is almost is 100% uh, in comparison with liquid culture DHT and uh, liquid cultures and uh, NAP. Uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, in, uh, in case of processed sputum, uh, it is almost 100% for almost all the cases, whereas it is 97.3% for uh, specificity for rifampicin resistance status. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, the WHO consolidated guidelines for tuberculosis, which gives endorsement, uh, WHO endorsement for moderate complexity automated NACs. And it talks about that globally isoniazid resistance uh, cases with rifampicin susceptible TB is estimated to be about 13.1%, especially in new cases and 17.4% in previously treated cases. Hence, upfront testing for rifampicin and isoniazid resistance is of utmost importance and the test belonging to this class are faster and less complex to perform than phenotypic culture-based drug susceptibility testing and line pro basic. They have the advantage of being largely automated following the sample preparation step. So moderate complexity automated NAC may be used as an initial test for detection of TB and resistance for both the first line TB drugs simultaneously, that is rifampicin isoniazid. They offer the potential for rapid provision of accurate results and for testing high efficacy uh, where high volumes of tests are required on daily basis. So this is a published literature um, <clears throat> from Job, John Hopkins University, uh, which talks about the uh, efficacy of the BDMAX. So the BDMAX has high sensitivity and uh, specificity for detection of both RIF and isoniazid resistance, consistent with current target for development of new tools for rapid DHTs for TB. Uh, so uh, along with this MDR TBSA, this uh, is a, a platform which has other uh, indigenously developed essays from the BD also, that is we have BDMAX entry essay, 
that is VDMAX bacterial assay, extended bacterial assay, enteric viral assay, and enteric parasitic assay, uh, other hospital acquired infection assay like C. difficile assay, staph SR assay, MRSA, XP assay, and also uh, it has uh, assays for sexually transmitted infection like CTG, CPV, and vaginal panel. And since it's an open system, it also has checkpoint CP, CP assay and vancomycin resistant assay, uh, many of which are still under um, uh, yet to be registered in India. So that's the overall thing uh, about the BDMAX platform that I wanted to discuss here. So thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vinok, for the for the for the talk. Now, our last speaker is Dr. Malu Gangadhar Reddy, sir. Uh, Dr. Gangadhar, sir, is a senior consultant and interventional pulmonologist at Ishoda Hospital, Sikandrabad. He has over 24 years of experience in the field of pulmonology. Dr. Gangadhar, sir, has several publications in various index, national and international journals to his credit. His special areas of interest and expertise are medical thoracoscopy, advanced bronchoscopy, sleep studies, bronchial thermoplasty and allergy testing and immunotherapy. Today, sir, would be taking us on diagnosis of TB, a clinical overview. Thank you, sir. Good evening. I am Dr. Ganga Reddy, consultant pulmonologist at Ashada Hospital, Sikindrapal. At the outset, I am very much thankful to the management of Ashada Hospital, Sikindrapal, as well Dr. Pavani and our team, microbiologists from Ashada Hospital, Sikindrapal, for organizing this webinar and giving me the opportunity to participate in today's webinar. So today, March 24th, we are observing a World TB Day. More than 100 years ago, Robert Park, this German microbiologist, has announced his discovery of typical bacilli, the causative agent, this day as World TB Day. And this year, the theme is Invest to End TB, Save Lives. So this is very much apt because we have to invest to more to curb this dreaded disease. So though we identified the causative organism more than 100 years ago, still TB remains the major cause of death from a single infectious agent in the adults. And more than 2 billion people, about one third of the world population are estimated to latently infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And there are 9 million new cases every year and 2 million deaths is happening because of TB. So there is very much need our timely interventions to minimize the community transmission so that we can save the world from this menace of tuberculosis. So India itself accounts one, one fourth of all TB worldwide burden. So there are around 2 million 64 lakhs fell ill with the TB in the 2019 and out of these 4.4 lakhs deaths were there and added to that around 1 lakh 24,000 cases of drug resistance also adding and 71,000 TB patients along with HIV fell ill in the year 2019. So the burden is almost around two deaths are happening every minute in India. So the burden is very grave. We have to take very effective measure to curb this menace. In India, then 40% of Indian population is already got infected. So that is latent infection. Out of these, 10% can progress to disease in their lifetime. Generally, these are the main risk factors like the old age, poor nutrition, alcoholism, silicosis, diabetes, or pregnancy, or those who are immunosuppressed. So these individuals, they may progress to the disease, active disease. So whenever there is droplet infection, that is when we inhale this droplet, a large into the alveoli of the lungs, there it produces a small focus of consolidation. And this small focus of the disease, most of the time they just con contained, but in five, percent of the cases they may progress to what is called progressive pulmonary tuberculosis and 90% of the time that is generally contained. 
But in the latter stages, or after a certain latent period, these the distant focus they may get reactivated, or because of reactivation, they will have what is called adult or post primary pulmonary tuberculosis. So, sometimes this primary tuberculosis itself they progress in five to seven ten percent of the patients. They lead to the other. Adult type of tuberculosis. Sometimes because of that dissemination uh, through lymphatics or venous spread, they, they uh, reach to the other organs and produces their disseminated tuberculosis. But most of the time, this is self-limited. Ninety percent of the time, it is present. But whenever a patient has cough of more than two weeks. Or fever of more than two weeks, or significant weight loss, along with hematopsis, and if there is any patch on the X-ray, we call them as present to pulmonary tuberculosis. And present to extra pulmonary tuberculosis, the case where there is presence of organ-specific symptoms, along with some constitutional symptoms, what we discussed earlier. So there is also one entity what is called clinically diagnosed TB. That is a presumptive TB case who is not microbiologically confirmed but has been diagnosed with active TB by a clinician on the basis of X-ray abnormalities, or history, or clinical signs, and the clinician decision to treat this patient with full course of anti-TB treatment. So these presumptive TB cases are diagnosed in various uh, various ways. So there are various modalities are available in this. So the microbiological part will be dealt by other microbiologists or other speakers. I will be focusing on the radiology, that is X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, tuberculosis skin test, micros, and certain cases where we need biopsies and fine needle aspiration and certain laboratory tests and body fluids. I will be focusing these things in my subsequent slides. So radiology is very very commonly applied investigation modality in the diagnosis of tuberculosis. But the diagnosis of TB primarily relies on the microbiological confirmation. But in such are not possible. Radiology plays uh, a vital role. So to interpret radiological findings, one must be aware of wide spectrum of presentation radiological and also should be able to distinguish active from patient disease. And one should also should assess the changes with response to treatment. Mind you, X-ray is very sensitive, but it is not specific because TB is a great mimicker and the no pattern is specific for the diagnosis of TB on radial on X-ray. So whenever patient inhales the bacilli, it goes to the alveoli, there it is the inflammatory reaction and it manifests either cavitation, consolidation or it can extend to pleura and it causes pleural effusion or by dissemination it may cause miliary shadows. So a TB patient is diagnosed as either having pulmonary tuberculosis or having extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And we will be discussing some of the radiological findings in these cases. Coming to the pulmonary tuberculosis, here we have two forms. One is primary and post-primary. So in the primary, 60% of the patient, they are asymptomatic, but they may have fever, cough, weight loss. Most of this seen in children are pediatric population. So whenever the organism checked till in the subpleural side, it will as uh, some a small patch of consolidation, what we call as bones focus. And if this involves the draining lymph nodes, so it causes a primary complex. Generally, this is contained very less percent, around 5%, it progresses to disease. But in post-primary, it occurs after a brief latent period or after 10 or 15 years, or it can be either because of the reactivation or reinfection. But sometimes it is overlap. We cannot totally differentiate with the primary or post-primary. So primary tuberculosis, generally they involve either lymph nodes or they can involve parenchymal tissue or they may present as pleural effusion or mediated TB. So lymph node tuberculosis in primary form is very, very common. It is said to be the hallmark. And in 83 to 96% of pediatric cases, they present as a lymph node tuberculosis. In that, right paratrachal and hilar nodes are the most common sites. So CD plays some role in uh, identifying or differentiating these uh, mediastinal lesions. Here you can see a 
clear cut necrosis where more suggestive of tuberculosis so other differential which forms for this lymph node uh, enlargement is metastatic disease lymphoma or other infection like histoplasmosis blastomycosis or sarcoidosis so parenchymal involvement in primary tuberculosis generally they present like consolidation or sometimes lymph node involvement or they may present with collapse or cavitary so in primary tuberculosis cavitary or collapse are very much uncommon they generally present either lymph node tuberculosis or consolidation pleural effusions in primary is not common miliary is my many of the times we see which may present like multiple sagobrain like lesions a size ranging from 3 mm and most are in the basilar preponderance so coming to the post primary or we call as secondary or oral type of tuberculosis it is generally seen in adolescents or adults which results from the reactivation of the primary disease in 90% or continuation of the primary disease in 5 to 10% it may present like parenchymal involvement or it may present with airway involvement or pleural or endobranchial involvement so parenchymal is the commonest one where it can present like consolidation or cavitation consolidation generally it is a non homogeneous seen in the apical lobes either unilaterally or bilaterally sometimes cavitation in 40 to 50% of the cases where it is the hallmark of reactivation of the tb here you can see the qual sometimes the fluid levels also you can appreciate so adult pulmonary tuberculosis they may present like the involvement of the tracheobronchial tree where you can see here the stenosis of the pregnant frontus sometimes it, these adult form of tuberculosis they extend to the pleura present like pleural effusion or there may be extension of the pleura directly forming the empyema sometimes they extend to the chest wall cavity presenting like empyema and stents sometimes they may also present like the hydronema thorax or bronchopleural fistula so if these disease is left untreated they may progress to lobar or complete lung destruction like this picture you can appreciate so in end stages sometimes they may present like bronchiectasis also so ct scan this is very very essential in certain cases where there is not clarity of the lesion it will delineate the infiltrates like this here or it is also useful to appreciate the lymphadenopathy you can see the minor complications like pneumothorax or you can identify the small effusions or it is also useful to uh, diagnose miliary form of the tuberculosis or it, it is also useful where you want to do ct guided fnac in certain peripheral lesions where there is no conclusion so radiology is also useful for the evaluation of such certain chest wall lesions like where you can appreciate destruction of the bone or postural lesions or you can see the soft tissue masses or you can appreciate the fistulation leading to the bronchopleural fistula sometimes radiology also helpful the involvement of the cardiac tb where you can see the pericardial thickening or pericardial effusions so one of the commonest involvement of the primary tuberculosis skeletal involvement where you can see that tb spondylitis one of the commonest involvement where we call pots disease the upper lumbar lower dorsal vertebra are most frequently involved here you can appreciate the destruction of the anterior bodies of the vertebra and you can also see the para vertebral abscess sometimes where it can present as collapses in the thorax or psoas abscess in the lumbar area so mri most of the times not useful for lung tuberculosis but useful for other forms of tuberculosis like central nervous system abdominal or genito urinary spinal gi adrenal or sometimes it can become uh, rare involvement of the other sites so here you can appreciate pre vertebral abscess and the tubercles in the central nervous system and peri lesional edema so ultrasound very much useful especially in extra pulmonary tuberculosis where you can see lymph nodal involvement in abdominal tuberculosis or genito urinary tuberculosis where you can see the involvement of the uterus fallopian tube Uh, irritants like that so ultrasound also useful in pulmonary tuberculosis especially where pleural effusions where you can assess the quantity and it aids to in drainage 
ultrasound also useful for uh, identifying the loculations where you can take further tests like the thoracoscopy where you can uh, uh, take the cases for thoracoscopy for debridement or taking the adhesions to aid the more pleural fluid aspirations. So one of the important modality in the diagnosis or evaluation of the tuberculosis is bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is very, very essential for the smear negative cases or patients where they cannot produce the sputum or when you are suspecting endobranchial tuberculosis. Branchial lava specimens, biopsies or transbranchial biopsies can be subjected for smears and gene experts or cultures or sometimes histopathological examination where it will cleanse the diagnosis. Just for example, here we have a case of 32 year female who presented with fever, chest pain, cough and wheezing. She was taking the bronchodilators and she was losing weight when she presented to us. She was not expectorating, so we had to go for bronchoscopy. So there you can appreciate this endobranchial tuberculosis, some caseous medical and stenosis of the left main bronchus. It can have turned out to be AAP positive. Another modality in the evaluation of tuberculosis is EBUS TVNA, where we it is very much useful for the evaluation of the mediastinal lymphadenopathy, where it can be a mimicker for sarcoidosis or lymphomas or some other malignancies, where TVNA samples would be objected to AAP smear, gene experts, AAP cultures. Here I show one case where sputum was negative, but TVNA, FNAC shown, gene expert positive, and histopathology showing K18 granulometers lymphadenopathy. This is how we do a subcarinal lymph node, FNAC, which was showing AFB positive. So another modality is the radial EBUS, where for especially useful for peripheral lesions where our convex EBUS will not reach, for example, a peripheral lesion. So this is the apparatus for radial EBUS. A 65-year-old male who presented with cough and weight loss, but his sputum was negative. When we subjected radial EBUS guided FNAC, it showed a granulomatous inflammation with AFB positive. So another modality is cryobiopsy, especially useful for diffuse involved lungs like in miliary tuberculosis or if there is involvement uh, suspicious of fungal or malignancy to rule out these cryobiopsy samples will help for histopathology as well as for microbiology. So this is another very important modality that is thoracoscopy. For example, a 40 year male who has presented with pleural effusion is pleural fluid was showing X state, but ADA was low, but there was strong suspicion of tuberculosis. So we subjected him for uh, thoracoscopy. There were a lot of radiations. We have broken that radiations. We took biopsy from this uh, suspicious involved uh, pleura, which turned out to be showing necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. So this is another interesting case, a 22 year old uh, boy who presented with pain, chest, fever and abdominal pain. He also has a tumor like thing over the perinephric area. So there was a strong suspicion of metastasis. But when we went in and we could appreciate these loculations, we also could see some shadow brain appearance. Yeah. This is very much characteristic of tuberculosis. On biopsy, which has revealed necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. So these are certain modalities which is very much useful for the evaluation of pulmonary tuberculosis. Coming to the another uh, last part of that is extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Extra pulmonary tuberculosis, any organ can be involved in extra pulmonary tuberculosis, but lymph node and pleura is the commonest involvement. They involve to the tune of 35 to 40 percent, pleura next around 20 percent. In this musculoskeletal system, spine is the commonest one and other organs are around 3 to 5 percent involvement we will see. So this is skeletal TB, lymph node TB where we can uh, aspirate from the lymph node involved lymph node that material can be subjected to the CBNADs, near culture or histopathology. 
this is a skeleton we can we can aspirate the fluid or we can take a biopsy in central nervous system tuberculosis we generally take csf and which be sent for further analysis in abdominal tuberculosis we can either take biopsy or we can take aseptic fluid that can be sent for analysis in genital urinary tuberculosis urine analysis or sometimes in uh, geo tuberculosis we can go for uh, endometrial curatages which can be subjected to AFP smear or gene experts or histopathological examination. Likewise, for extra pulmonary tuberculosis, depending on the site of involvement, we can either uh, take the local site to fluid or we can take some biopsy from the involved area which can be subjected for further analysis to cleanse the diagnosis. So, for example, in uh, various biological fluids like acetic, pleural, or pericardial CSF, generally we see straw color fluids with lymphocytic predominant and it can be most of the times x ray and ADA is raised more than 30. As the level increases, the possibility of tuberculosis also increases. So, depending on the various studies, this is the specificity sensitivity of ADA in various fluids ranging from 68 to 97 percent. So, coming to the latent TB, so to diagnose latent TB, we have two tests that is tuberculous skin test and IGRA test. Generally, tuberculous skin test is done with five IU PPDs. So, if it is more than 10 millimeters, we consider as positive, but more than five also considered positive in HIV infected immunocompromised patients. So, positive indicates the diagnosis most of the time in TB in children. Also, it is helpful for the INH prophylaxis. Sometimes it is considered positive when it is in, in ideal clinical settings where if it is more than 20 mm. But one thing very much we should be, uh, it should be interpreted with very much caution because there is cross reactivity with the BCG vaccination. Also positive when patient is exposed to non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So another important modality is IGRA, that is uh, a blood-based test where a antigen is added to the patient's serum, thereby interferon released is assayed. So if this is expensive, but there is no cross-reactivity with the prior PCJ vaccination or environmental bacteria. We have TST, spot TB or gamma interferon TB. Both tests are available, both are equally sensitive. So whenever a patient of contact with the positive microbiological confirmed case or people living with HIV or high-risk individuals or children of contacts, whenever these patients, we need to treat them, we evaluate for them for the activity of the disease. If there are no active symptoms, if these TST and IGRA are positive, they are subjected for INH prophylaxis. If this is positive, they are also uh, evaluated further with X-ray and sputum sample. If these are negative, they can be offered INS prophylactic therapy. If this is positive, then they are considered as active disease and they are further treated as a case of tuberculosis. So this is the general approach. Whenever a patient presents with this uh, classical symptoms where we call presumptive TB, chest X-ray is done. And if it X-ray is highly suggestive, then his sputum is subjected for NAD test. If it is confirmed, we call it a microbiologically confirmed case. But if it X-ray is non-specific, we give a course of antibiotic, then again we repeat X-ray. If the shadows are pers persistent, again we send these samples for the NAD test. If this is negative, again, search for extra pulmonary tuberculosis. If that again from the samples from the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, if it that turns out to be positive, then treat like a microbiologically confirmed case. But if it is negative, but if still clinically it is suggestive of tuberculosis, treat like a clinically diagnosed case of tuberculosis. If X ray is uh, not suggestive, you can give antibiotics and you can wait. But if X ray is normal, you can search for other causes of. Uh, fever and cough. So, this is the general algorithm. Generally, presumptive case after evaluating, we either confirm as a microbiologically confirmed or clinically confirmed case. Likewise, same for extra pulmonary tuberculosis also. We follow this uh, algorithm, what I discussed just now. Then we label them as microbiologically confirmed case or clinically confirmed case. So, with that, I am coming to the end of today's talk. 
So to conclude, a large number of tests are available for diagnosis of TB. Use these tests judiciously depending on the clinical situation because radiological investigations are more sensitive but not specific and they are costly and not accessible to many. So microbiological tests are still gold standard, also gives the pattern of drug resistance, but it takes time. But and all labs are also not adequately equipped. So, however, clinical discretion is very much required in certain cases to further investigate in making diagnosis of TB and to adopt an effective therapeutic measure to help the individual and the community at large to minimize this burden of this age-old immunity. Thank you one and all. And if, if there are any questions, I am ready to answer. Thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gangadhar. Uh, so I kindly request the audience, if you have any questions, please, you can post it. Uh, meanwhile, I have already have got a couple of questions from the audience. Maybe since we have overshot our time, maybe we can spend a few more minutes and uh, get those uh, questions uh, clarified. So first question is from uh, Kumar, uh, Kumari Seema from Ranchi. Uh, she wants to know, uh, Dr. Gangadhar, this question uh, I'm directing towards you. So what will be the sample for abdominal TB, sir? Pardon, can you please repeat the question? I... What, what will be the sample in case of abdominal TB, sir? Abdominal TB. Okay, okay. Abdominal TB, again, the site of involvement, generally abdominal TB, they may present with uh, ascites or any abdominal lymph node involvement or sometimes... Uh, tubercles on the mesentery. So if lymph nodes are there, ultrasound guided, we can obtain the sample. If ascites is there, you can tap and send for analysis. Even sometimes mesentery biopsy also can be considered. Depending on the organ involvement, if spleen is there, if ureters are there, uh, liver is there, or uh, uh, like that. If whatever the organ is involved, you try to pick up uh, some sample from that involved organ. And ultrasound helps a immense role in that aspect. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the response. So there is one more question related to the man to testing. Uh, so, sir, you told me, uh, told us in your presentation that for uh, um, I mean tuberculin skin test, uh, the recommended dose is five tuberculin unit. Uh, but yeah, uh, so there there is one question, interesting question from the audience that how significant is the man to test if you are using two tuberculin unit in adults, sir? Yeah, that is, there is some modified uh, things are there because if in India, when we are using five test units, uh, the positivity is going very high. So really it want to see the population which are really required or really hypersensitive, two test units uh, policy has been adopted because to minimize the false positives. So many of the labs, they are con uh, they are using two test units just to minimize the false positives. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so there is one question regarding the liquid culture, so which I can take up probably. Uh, Rahul Jagannath from Varanasi, so he wanted to know for liquid cultures, is the biosafety level 3 required or mandatory? So even uh, I think Dr. Harita in her presentation, uh, uh, you, uh, I mean, put forward this point. So for all the liquid cultures, especially, uh, I mean, all the liquid cultures, uh, uh, I mean, the recommendations are to have a biosafety level of two or above. Uh, is the recommendation. So that is what the recommendation says. So that's for uh, Dr. Rahul Jagannath. Uh, meanwhile, if any, I mean, that's all the questions that we have received until now from the audience. If we, any of the experts, if you want to ask any questions to Dr. Gangadhar, please feel free or maybe we can uh, conclude the session. Dr. Pawni, Dr. Swati, any questions for Dr. Gangadhar? Uh, okay, sir, I think, uh, yeah, so that's all since... Uh, uh, we have overshot our time by 10 minutes, so probably let's end here. So on behalf of uh, BD India, I'd like to thank Dr. Gangadhar Reddy, Dr. Pawni and Dr. Harita for taking out time from their busy schedule and making this event a successful one. And of course, I would like to thank Dr. Swati for moderating this session. Next, I would like to thank Department of Microbiology of Ashada Group of Hospitals Hyderabad for giving us this opportunity to be associated with them. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you for sparing your valuable time and joining us this evening. Before we end today, 
I kindly request all the audience to please give your valuable feedbacks following which you'll be able to download your individual participation certificates. This webinar recording will be shared with all the registered participants. And for more details and queries on BD products, please do refer to the resources section or kindly reach out to our regional sales leader in BD India contact section. Uh, thank you one and all. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pramnal. Thank you, other team. Thank you all. Uh, thank, you, thank you, sir. And thank you, Vinod, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swati, Dr. Pavani, Dr. Harita, and Dr. Gangadhar. So it was a pleasure interacting with all of you. Hope uh, we see in, uh, we can continue this association with the other group of hospital in future too. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.